Welcome to the Miko Pellet Hour. This is Miko Pellet. I'm your host. It's been a few weeks. It's good to be back. Uh, today I'm speaking with uh, another remarkable Palestinian leader, Hanin Zabi from the city of Nazareth. Um, Hanin was a, is an exceptional leader and has been active for the liberation of Palestine for many, many years. She spent an entire decade as a member of the Israeli Knesset. For those of you who don't know, the Knesset is the Israeli House of Representatives. Um, Israel only has one house. There's no Senate like we do in the U.S. It's the House of Representatives. It has 120 seats. And when people vote, they don't vote for a representative. They vote for a party. And the party selects the representatives uh, during their own primaries. So it's a very strange kind of democracy. And there are several political parties that represent the Palestinian community who are citizens of the state of Israel. So there are there is a community of almost 2 million Palestinians who are citizens of the state of Israel. And there are a few political parties who represent them. And like I said, <clears throat> Hanin was a member of one of these parties and represented that uh, party in the Knesset. So we're going to talk about her background, uh, what it's like to serve if Israel is really a democracy as it claims to be, since Palestinian citizens are allowed to vote. And then we'll talk about how the situation in Gaza currently is impacting people. As I said, she is from the city of Nazareth in the Galilee, way up in the northern part of Palestine. So, Hanin, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, we've known each other for a long time. It's always a pleasure to speak to you. And perhaps you can, we can start with the big question, which is, is Israel really a democracy? Israel is claiming it's a democracy because Palestinians can vote, because Palestinians like yourself were members of the Knesset, members of the House of Representatives. Is Israel a democracy? Um, thank you, Miko, uh, so for this opportunity. It is nice to uh, see you again and to talk uh, with you. Um, actually, it is a very weird question uh, addressing in this time why Israel is killing, has killed 30,000 Palestinians and I'm Palestinian. Uh, but if I take this question seriously, emotionally, it's hard for me to think about Israel as a democracy while it is conducting a genocide against my people. So if Israel is conducting a genocide against my people and I'm a Palestinian before I was a citizen, and we, the two millions, one and a half, didn't choose to be citizens. It was forced upon us, this citizenship. No one asked us after expelling 85% of our people in, 90, in, in 1948, after exp and destroying more than 400 Palestinian villages, and establishing Israel as a Jewish, a pure Jewish state, no one asked us if we want this citizenship. So it was forced, this citizenship. It was an artificial citizenship because it was the condition of the UN to accept Israel as a member in the United Nations. It was the, the, the condition, one condition of the United Nations. And there was a lot of debate within the Israeli government, 1948, whether uh, Israel will grant, uh, will give us this citizenship because it is a question. It's logical to be a question. It is not uh, taken for granted because when the Zionists came to my homeland, the intention and the plan was to create a Jewish, a Jewish state. A Jewish state means a state for the Jewish people a pe without, it's, it's a pure Jewish state. It is, it is a religion. Uh, it is not a state for the citizens. It is a state for the Jewish all over the world. So the Zionist plan is to bring the Jewish from all over the world on the exp to replace the Palestinians. It is it is a it, it is a replacement project. So this was this this is why the uh, conduct an ethnic cleansing, as I said, killing at eighty five percent. But and then thought that the remaining 15% will be very easy to man manipulate, will be very easy to control, will be very easy 
uh, to, to make a political genocide. This means those 15%, 100,000 million Palestinians, 100,000 Palestinians whom Israel didn't expel, they were controlled by a strategy which called citizenship. Citizenship is not to grant us rights. It is a strategy to control us, to rewrite our history. We are not allowed to um, study our history, although we pay taxes for the Ministry of Education, but we study the history of Zion, the Jews and the history of Zionism. Okay, and, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me stop and, for a second. I will, I will, I, 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 I I will fix myself. A distorted history of the Jewish people and a distorted history of uh, Zionism. This is what you, you want to No, I just want to give the context uh, to, to see if uh, make sure I, we understand you correctly. So you're saying in 1948, the state of Israel was established. 85% of the Palestinian population that existed in Palestine at the time were expelled. The 15% that remained, you said some 100,000, were granted a citizenship, not really granted a citizenship, but forced into a citizenship of a state that really did not want them and that they, they did not want either because it was declared as a Jewish state. Exactly. And Jewish citizens, um, people like my family, my parents, were immigrants who came to settle the country, colonizers. And this would became their state, not yours, even though you and your people were there um, beforehand. And so, it's a, so you're saying now that the citizenship really was not something that was given as kind of you know as as a positive thing, but it was a way to control. A way to control. Yeah, it is. It, it was not part of our our. Um, an implementation of a democratic notion. It was an implementation of um, another way of oppressing us, another way of controlling us, de -balastinization. It was a strategy of de -balastinization. Can I say that in English, de -balastinization? To, to, to To reach our identity, to reshape, to rewrite our history, actually and to continue with an oppressive uh, with with an oppressive policies uh, um, um, uh, in english um to uh, uh expropriate i suppose yeah yeah to uh, to, to uh, so they continue to uh, um, um, Confiscate. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. No, uh, to, to confiscate our land, to gather us within the smallest geographical area in order to control the land, most of the land, for developing Jewish towns and villages, uh, a kind of a small ghettos, to create a kind of small ghettos for Palestinians. They didn't call us Palestinians, of course. They gave us identity, Arab Israelis, which we are, this means we are not 100% Arabs, we are not 100% Israelis, we are Israelis uh, um, in, 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 in a notion of being loyal to Israel. We, we should be Israelis, we should be loyal to Israel, not to have rights from the state, and we can be Arab in a folkloristic meaning to eat Arab food, but not to have Arab Arabic identity and Palestinian identity. So let me, let me ask you something, let, just again to clarify. So you were given, so you, the Palestinians who remained when the state of Israel was established and became citizens, were they different than the Jewish citizens? How were they different? Were they citizens or were they not citizens? How can there be two different citizenships? I don't of understand. Course. I mean, I do understand, but I want you to explain. When you say apartheid, you don't mean just an apartheid within the occupied territories, within uh, the West Bank, but it, it, we have here also in the basic 
democratic, what they call democratic Israel, an apartheid regime with there are a of laws, more than 85 laws, which legally discriminate against the Palestinian in every aspect of life, in every sphere of life. Education, budgets, land, housing, planning, um, uh, identity, collective, collective uh, rights. So we don't have any collective rights. We, as Sharon said, you don't have rights uh, on land, you have rights above the land. The this citizenship is more like a residency. It's a temporal, even if it is not a residency. It is a temporal residency. Let me ask, let me interrupt you again. So, and I, I hate to interrupt you, but I want to clarify this. Yeah. So the state of Israel is established. Of course, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip were not part of the equation at all. They were not part of the country at all. We're talking 20 years before the occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. So the citizen, so the Palestinian, 100,000 Palestinians who remained in Palestine became citizens. Um, what, so were they, were you able, were they able to go anywhere they want? Could they live? Because they built new cities and new towns for Jews. So if a Palestinian wanted to buy a house in Tel Aviv or any other Israeli city, could they move to another city? Can they go live anywhere they want? Can they travel? Did they have the same rights as the Jewish Israelis? What, what were the differences? More, okay, more, uh, 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 more historical context. The, the, till from 1948 till 1966, we were under military regime. Under military regime, this means that, that mean? this means that we couldn't move outside our small villages unless we have a permission. And the military, which was controlled the life, uh, the life of the Palestinians, didn't give permissions to move either. If you have, but unless you have a very a convincing or emergent uh, emergent needs. So we couldn't move from our land. Israel started confiscating, confiscating 87% of the land of the Palestinians. When Israel was established 1948, Israel controls, controlled 6% of the land of the Palestinians. And, and the land is a very crucial issue because colonialism is first of all about controlling the land and the people. So you control the people by expelling 85%. This is the, the most criminal way to control the people, ju just by finishing them, by expelling them. And then you, the, the, you should control the land. Israel has controlled 6% before the establishment of Israel. Now, we, the Palestinians, 20% uh, of the population we own 2.3% of the land. By law, Israel confiscated the land. So if Israel is now confiscating the land from the West Land, from the West Bank, by the military, by the, the military, Israel confiscating the land of 48 by the law. So the law is the apartheid uh, regime. Now, we didn't, we, we were not able to move, we were able to work unless we were 100 we, we proved 100 percent loyalty to the state of israel uh, israel as, as i said confiscated land and she rewrite the curriculum the curriculum of the um, the schools uh, and 85 uh, she banned all the parties all the arab parties because and, but the, um, except the communist, uh, the Israeli Communist Party, because the Israeli Communist Party was the only party which recognized Israel in 1948 as a Jewish state. Of course, uh, um, um, okay, I will not say. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me just stop right here again and just recap again, just to make sure we understand. So basically, you're saying that from 1948, until 1966, the Palestinians who became citizens of the state of Israel were actually living under a military occupation and had no rights. So it was an apartheid, kind of a military apartheid regime from the very beginning. In other words, you were not equal citizens. 
the Palestinians were not equal citizens to the Jewish uh, settlers who became citizens, it was a completely different reality. It wasn't really a democracy. It was it was an apartheid that was enforced by the military, by the military. Yes, and 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 it had no freedom really. Yeah, had no the, freedom as citizens. The sentence, your sentence, from the very beginning is very important, very crucial. This means that regardless the reaction of the Palestinian, and this is what we can learn now from Gaza. Regardless the reaction of the Palestinian, the notion of replacing the Palestinians, the notion of expelling the Palestinian, the notion of a Jewish state as pure Jewish state without rights for the Palestinians, the notion that the Palestinians are an existence, a threat for Israel, just their existence, not their struggle, not their resistance, their existence is a threat for Israel, is a very it is it is an a DNA the DNA for the concept of Israel. It is regardless, and and this is very important to understand the dynamics now and then between the Palestinians and Israel. So we didn't resist the Palestinians for the eight. We didn't resist. We accept Israel. We didn't challenge the notion of Israel, even politically. Not to talk about military. We of course. Even politically, we didn't challenge the notion of Israel. We were the poorest part of the Palestinian people because when Israel expelled our people, it expelled first of all the the um, uh, the people of the um, uh, rich towns, Yaffa, Akka, Haifa, Lidramle. It expelled the middle class. It expelled, and so we 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 were the poorest and the most fragile. 15%. Although, and we didn't challenge Israel, who we just want to, to survive. It, it, it's just to survive. The name of uh, to survive. The name of the game was to survive, even though Israel perceived us as an obstacle. And within the discourse, 40, 50 years after, part of the discourse was that Israel regret the fact that it didn't expelled 100% of the Palestinian 48. So regardless you are challenging Israel or not, regardless your reaction and actions, the, the mere fact that you exist as a Palestinian, you exist as a non-Zionist, not just as a Palestinian, even as a non-Zionist, uh, this is, is perceived in Israel as an obstacle. And in order to deter, to deter, any political development, any political awareness from the side of the Palestinians uh, who became citizens of Israel, Israel banned education, a historic, um, banned us from uh, studying our history, from from uh, active, um, from political activity, and the only, with eighty five percent of the Palestinians voted for Zionist parties, not till the end of the military regime, not till 1966, till 1980. So 15 years after the end of the military, we were so mutia. We, mutia? We, we were so confer, confirm, confirmism? Conf Conforming. Yeah, we were, we were so, we were the good Arabs. So this is this is the, the, the differentiation, uh, the, 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 the labels of Israel. The good Arab, we were we were good Arabs, and even though, regardless this uh, your reaction, as I said, the notion is to replace the Palestinians, to have most of the land, if not all of the land, for the uh, for the development of uh, Jewish villages. Israel has developed. Uh, more than 760, some 760 uh, village and towns exclusively for the Jewish, exclusively. Now, we, as I said, and it's a very important statistics, this is why I repeat it. We are 20% of the population. We live upon 2.3% of the land. So let, and, me ask you, let me ask you another question. So... So the Palestinians, again, this is before 1967, before the West Bank and Gaza. We're talking about the original, so to speak, 
state of Israel with the good, uh, the good Israel. This is yeah. the good. Okay, the good, the proper, yes. Yeah. So you're describing an apartheid state from the very beginning, which, by the way, the amnesty report described. You're describing a population that was living under a very harsh military regime with no rights, but they were allowed to vote and they were allowed to run for office in the Knesset and the House of Representatives. Now, I remember names very, you know, courageous and perhaps revolutionary names of politicians like Emil Habibi and Tofik Ziad and people who were not really conforming. And they were also in the Knesset and they were also able to voice their opinions. And in a way that helped Israel to say it's a democracy because they actually could, they could say, look, we have these voices even in the Knesset. And then later on, of voices like yourself, which I want to talk about separately later on. Can you explain that? Because there is a contradiction here. Yes, it is a good question, very hard question, very hard for me to answer uh, because of the language. Uh, the, the, the limits of the, our political free, freedom is an indication of Israel, Israel's self-confidence about itself. This means that in a very sophisticated way, after the military, uh, uh, military regime ended in 1966, in the 70s, Israel allowed for a different parties, for different Arab parties. So there was, in the 70s, uh, and this Islamic movement has um, uh, started to uh, to be active, and uh, the progressive the Yes. Yes. But there was when Israel allowed Palestinian parties to emerge in the Israeli politics, it put a condition. No party should challenge the notion of Israel as a Jewish entity. So this part of maneuvering between the between this within this contradiction, being a Jewish state and being a democratic state, this is, in my opinion, the biggest. This is a strategical tact, a very clever strategic, strategical tactics of Israel to say, I am a democracy by allowing the movement and freedom of expression of the Palestinian till the limit that we can really make the state a state for the citizens, a, a real democratic state. So the limit is to believe in yourself that you may have an individual rights, but not a collective rights. I may have a right as an Arab Israeli, but not a political right as a Palestinian. I don't belong to the land. The, this land is for the Jewish people, even for you as American, even for, for any Jew who didn't live within Israel, within, for, within the historical Palestine. This is his land, his homeland, but not mine. I don't have, so I cannot connect my struggle to the struggle of the Palestinian people. There are three conditions which, which depoliticize the struggle of the Palestinians in Israel. You should not, you cannot challenge Israel as a Jewish state. So, Yes, you can maybe demand for more budgets. You may demand for more land. You may demand for better education, but not for your own historical position as indigenous people. Forget about this historical consciousness. Forget about your identity. Forget about your narrative, historical narrative. You, I'm, I'm, you should behave as um, a resident, again, again, it is a mentality of a resident, which doesn't belong, belong to the history of his land, doesn't belong to the land. He can just struggle for a better individual, liberal 
lots. As a resident, not as a, 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 a citizen, let alone not as an indigenous people. So part one, condition number one, you should not challenge Israel as a, a Jewish people and, the, and that this land belongs to the Jewish 2,000 years ago, not for you. you. We are making for you a favor. So you must, you must thank us every day that we didn't expel you. We should, you must thank us. We allow you to be here, not because it is an inherent, your inherent, not because it's your history, not because it's your land. No, because we are so sublanim. We are so, we are tolerant. Very tolerant. Yeah, tolerant. Yeah. But let me ask you another question. Let me, so let me ask you something. Okay. Second condition, you should not connect your struggle with the rest of your people. You, sh you should disconnect your struggle from the struggle of Palestinian people. You are not a Palestinian. You should have, you should behave as an Arab Israeli. You should believe that you start to, your start, you, your history starts after 1948. You don't have any history. So you should not identify yourself with the rest of your people and you should not pull not not politically and not even emotionally okay so let me ask you this um with everything that you said we know that the palestinian citizens of israel even today are among the poorest of the poor among israeli citizens are the palestinian citizens of israel Oh. We know that in the Naqab, for example, the poverty and, and, and discrimination is abhorrent. I mean, you've got all these very wealthy Israeli settlements across the street from, from horrific conditions of the Palestinian citizens of Israel, the Palestinian uh, uh, Bedouin, for example. And that's just one example. And, you know, this goes through Lid, the Ramle, Yaffa, it goes through the Galilee where you exist and so on. So what are the virtues of having Palestinian parties in the Knesset anyway since it allows Israel to say it's a democracy and still, in terms of resources and everything you touched on, the discrimination uh, is, is very, very obvious against the Palestinian citizens of Israel. So what's the point? Okay, also a complicated question with a complicated answer. But let me, I, uh, I realized from your uh, question that uh, I may give an impression about our right to struggle for individual rights. We have a right to struggle for our individual rights, but we don't have individual rights. So, uh, as you said, more than 56% of the Palestinians are under poverty, poverty line. Yeah. But more than 67% uh, from the Palestinian children are under poverty line. And the equ equation between individual rights uh, and, and collective rights, Israel is trying to handle it in, um, in, in a sophisticated way to keep us in a level which we, we, which she think above this level of individual rights, educational rights, we will start to develop, uh, we, we will be stronger in, in political sense. So, we should our percentage in, in 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 universities according to a secret document should not be higher than 11 percent although the age our this level of age from 17 years till 24 years are 25 percent of the population of the Palestinian population is within this within the age of university but our percentage on, on the universities should not be above 11 percent so they are they know that the, the connection between individual rights and collective rights uh, as long yani, uh, there is there, there is um, a positive connection so they keep you under a certain percent of education of poverty in order to weaken you also in the collective sense.
because there, as I said, there, there is a connection between individual rights and collective rights. Now, we must, I, I will be now critical toward our, towards ourselves. The communist, the Israeli Communist Party has agreed from the beginning, 1948, to be represented in the Knesset and to accept, to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. And because of this, it was allowed to, to emerge within the Israeli uh, 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 politics. Uh, so your question was, I forgot your question. My what question is, is, my question is, since it's not working, since Palestinian rights as as citizens are uh, don't really exist in terms of education, healthcare, any rights that you want. I mean, the poverty is 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 horrible, uh, and yet, why are Palestinians running and voting? Why are they participating in this in this lie? Why are they participating in the Knesset? I will give you two reasons, and just then thing, just to give context to people, the the Israeli Communist Party was the only party that really allowed for Palestinian voices, right? That was why so many Palestinian leaders ended up in the in the in the Communist Party. Yes, allowed. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I thought I I I said this. There there are two main reasons. The first reason it's a way to develop uh, an Arab leadership and an Arab voice. Even if you don't change, you don't have, this is the logic. You may, you may, not, you, you may not agree, but this is the logic. Till Ghazi. For me, till, till few years ago. We need not just, to, we, we, even if we didn't influence, Israel, because it's a colonialist, and we part those, not all the political elite recognize Israel as a colonialist project. This is very important. We we don't have uh, 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 we are not unified in our political thinking. Not all the parties recognize Israel as a colonial. But remind me in this point after with this point after later. So we need to develop and to cultivate uh, a local Palestinian leadership. We need to have a direct discourse uh, and we need as a leaders to address our people, not through the state. So the Knesset was a platform to cultivate a national discourse and to cultivate a national vision, even if, if it is hard to implement. Okay, I have to stop you just a minute because we have to, I have to take a break. So I'm gonna stop you, excuse me, just a minute. We're gonna take a short break. This is the Miko Pellet Hour. I'm speaking with Hanin Zawabi, uh, local leader in, in Palestine from Nazareth, and we will be right back after this. Hi again, this is Miko Pellet. You're listening to the Miko Pellet Hour. I'm having a, uh, a fascinating conversation with Hanin Zabi. She is in Nazareth, Nazareth uh, Palestine, a local Palestinian leader who, who served in the Israeli House of Representatives, the Knesset, for, a whole, for an entire decade. Uh, so thank you for joining us. And I interrupted you before the break, so please continue. Thank you. So it is about cultivating identity, and political national consciousness. So the Knesset was a platform, since we are a poor society, we don't have independent newspapers. We had tens of newspapers before 1948. Now, we don't have a daily Arabic newspaper. Not one. We have two local radio channels which are uh, funded by Israel. We don't have the economic ability to, to create our national media. We are very, very controlled by the state. Economically, we are controlled. So the Knesset was platform to organize ourselves to try to build a collectivity, a kind of collectivity with a national discourse, 
with a Palestinian discourse, which the minimum was to preserve, preserve, yeah, our identity. And, and that's it, not to challenge. The, the last phase of the state during the military regime, the name of the game was to survive, not to challenge anything. Not even, we didn't call ourselves Palestinians, we, we didn't call ourselves, my mother and my father didn't say to us, you are a Palestinian. I discovered during, um, uh, when I was in um, seventh grade, that I'm a Palestinian. I discovered it, it was for me. I am a Palestinian, I am something. Because before, 13 years old, I was nothing. No one, of course, told me that I am an Israeli. When I, when I, when I asked my mother, what is this flag, the Israeli flag? She said nothing. It is nothing. She <laughs> didn't answer. Because she didn't, she, the generation, Israel was, it was a very, it's, it's a traumatic event. Nakba is a traumatic event. I should, and, and I am, I am, um, I am not so old. I was born, I, I born in 1968. So after the end of the military regime, but no one said to us and to my friends, to my generation, you are a Palestinian. Israel expelled your people. No, 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 no. No, we were so afraid we want to survive. So, so 20 years, the name of the game was to survive. You lost your people. You lost your identity. You lost your society. You lost your your cities. You lost your cinemas. You lost your newspapers. You lo you lost your manufacturers. You lost everything. Everything. It is like now Gaza. Gaza lost its streets, it, uh, and its trees, and its hosp hospitals, and its so, so we, the same. So and the same without the TV, without the session in London, without anything and, and and with as a colonial regime with the support not of america like now from britain so 20 years till the 60s the end of the 60s the name of the game was to survive the 70s and the 80s was the beginning so you you should you you, you, should, you should understand the gradual development of the palestinian people within, uh, uh, within the historical land of uh, Palestine. So 70s and 80s, the name of the game, again, was not to challenge Israel as a Jewish state, not to challenge Zionism, but to call ourselves Palestinians, to, to have a collective, um, to, 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 to cultivate our discourse, to remember the Nakba, to talk about a little bit, a little bit about that we are a Palestinian, the land day in 1976, but we will not uh, we have time for that. So, so it is, I think, normal I... Uh, to say that we want to enter Knesset to have some political expression about ourselves some political expression about a Palestinian collectivity. So express a kind of collectivity, because without the funding of the Knesset, now my party, the National Democratic Party, which was, was, I think was revolutionary, challenging, the first party challenging Israel. Hold on, I want, I want to ask you about, about your party, about Balad, and about your own decision to run for office and to, and to serve for 10 no, years. No, no. So please, yeah, yeah. Idea: We don't have money to create a political movement outside the, without without the budget of the Knesset, without the funding of the Knesset. Now we cannot. There is nothing. We don't have money for a youth movement. So our economic position and 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 keeping um, us from the land and from our wealth. Because land is not just a simple struggle. Land is a wealth. And we become, we lost our land. So we lost our, and our economy and everything. So the Knesset, to finish my answer, was 
representing uh, 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 election and representation within the Knesset was a kind of creating a sort of Palestinian collectivity. So it is not just about influencing the state. Okay. So I want to talk about the political party you belong to, Balad. You call the, the National Democratic Party. The founder of the of the party, if I'm not mistaken, Azmi, Dr. Azmi Bshara, is in exile. Was forced into exile. You uh, you were a very very powerful voice in the Knesset for a decade. Um, and uh, so talk about the party. And and several times they tried to disqualify you from running uh, the your, your particular party, Balad and I think you individually as well. So talk a little bit about that particular party because it is different, I think. It stands on, on, on the national issues is, is unique and about your political uh, activism as, as a member of the party and in general. Oh, no. Actually, the, the um, um, hudud, borders, oh, borders. borders, the border of the game, the political game, was you can struggle, you cannot struggle, you can fight for your uh, demand, not fight, demand for your individual and some collective right within the 70s and 80s, but you cannot challenge Israel. No one think, no Palestinian party thought to challenge. I think the progressive, we, okay, so uh, after all, parts of progressive party uh, and those who left communist party and and abna el balad the sons of the village created a party based upon not logically upon not accepting us so let me just clarify the progressive party you're talking about it's called the progressive party for peace my father ran for the Knesset and was a member of Knesset as part of that for one for one term. But then after that, it was dissolved. And Oslo, of course, so the Oslo Accord that you're talking about. And then after that, everything changed. So anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So Oslo was about ending the Palestinian as uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, struggle as a struggle for freedom, as a struggle for liberation and also accepted Israel as a Jewish state. Yeah. And Israel has, uh, Oslo has accepted, the Palestinian leadership has accepted the fact that we are not part of the Palestinian people and accepted the fact that we should, and send a message to us that you, the one million, no, we were not, I don't know our number then. You, the Palestinians inside Israel, should, should connect your political destiny, 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 with is not with the rest of your people. Accepting Israel as a Jewish state, giving legitimacy to Zionism, giving legitimacy to what Israel has done in 1948 was a fault, and we we felt alone. We felt that the PLO has not just forget about us and forget about the rest of the Palestinians. So the notion, the way we thought in order to reopen the struggle with Zionism, in order to send the message that Zionism, that Zionism is the problem. It is not, the Palestinian issue is not an issue of borders. It is not about borders. It is not about state. It is not about political entity. It is about liberation. It's about equality. It's about justice. This is the Palestinian issue. All of the victims of Gaza and of 48 wanted liberation. Our struggle, we want liberation. We want freedom. And Zionist is a colonial, is a colonial system. And there is no way other and equality for all. Equality and justice is the name of the game, not state or two states. It is not a struggle for state again, it's a struggle for freedom. And Oslo, uh, uh, the state is the way 
or the way to implement your freedom, but also has turned the notion of the state as a tool for accepting occupation. The state of Oslo, the notion of state within Oslo, of course, was another way of occupation. Oslo was another, a, a much more severe way of occupation because it's occupation with consent of the Palestinian. It is to give legitimacy to Zionism, is to give legitimacy to occupation because Israel will not end occupation, because Israel doesn't want to end occupation. And because it is not the right way to negotiate before Israel recognizes the fact of occupation. And Israel should recognize the fact of, of occupation. Israel should say that I want to end occupation, and then you can start negotiating how occupation. Negotiations should be about how to, not whether there, whether there is an occupation. Because still also, Israel didn't admit that there is an occupation. So the notion of NDA, National Democratic Assembly, my party was Israel as a Jewish state. We, it, is, it is not a legitimate state as a Jewish state. We should have state for all the citizens, not a Jewish state, st a normal state, the simple normal state should be state for the citizens, not state for Nico Pellet who is in America and who is not here and not for Hanin. So this was the political vision platform of National Democratic Party. We want state within 48, which is a ah, we accept ah, we accept because of Oslo, we accept and because this was the decision of PLO, we said okay, a Palestinian state within for within 67, the, the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, a state for all of the citizens in 48 and the right of return. This was the political vision. And this was a revolutionary vision to say that there is no legitimacy for Jewish state. Of course, we didn't use this language because this is, this is uh, against the law. But we say that for, we, we didn't say we don't recognize Israel as because we cannot, you cannot be so. Yeah, yeah. honest. So, you say so honest. We said uh, Zionism is, uh, we said there is a contradiction of being a democratic state and a Jewish state. And we want to resolve this contradiction. How to resolve this contra uh, contradiction? We demand state for all the citizens. That's it. So a state of all its citizens was reason to, to, to try to disqualify the party from running for elections. Exactly, now, because you, now, you are the democracy, so yeah. you are. So in other words, there's a contradiction. So, so that really answers the question I asked at the very, very beginning, is Israel a democracy? And of course, you gave all the reasons why it's not, but this is really the final line, the final touch. If you call for Israel to be a state of all of its citizens, which basically to cause for equality for all the citizens, then uh, then you uh, that is that is a reason to disqualify you. So uh, talking uh, about your own democracy is a threat, not Hamas. It is democracy is a threat. The Palestinians are a threat. So it is not just Israel is is not a democracy. She she oppressed and she call anyone who demand for a democracy a terrorist. Israel call us a terrorist, not because we fight in a military weapons, not because even we throw stones, because we call for a state of all of the citizens. So democracy is a strategic threat for Israel. You just said, oh, we need to go to this. You need to say this again. You said it's not Hamas that's a threat, it's democracy that's a threat. Yes. Talk about that. You talk. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Okay. Um, bef 
before the 7th of October. Uh, Gaza was 60, uh, Gaza was since two, 2008 within a siege, the biggest open jail on the earth. And they have tried everything. Demonstration, Masirit al a march of return, uh, uh, to, 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 to remind the people that there is a siege. Israel has, uh, has killed those who demonstrate, has killed them. Those, the, even children, snipers, 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 has, uh, she, put, he, she uses the snipers, it uses the snipers in order to kill Palestinians. Now, in the West Bank, uh, she oppressed any demonstration. She tried to, she, after Oslo, even after Oslo, she expanded just 10 years after Oslo, immediately after Oslo. Israel expanded the settlements three times and expanded the number, raised the number of the settlers three times. So this means that, as I said before at the beginning, regardless of the way you resist, you are an obstacle to the notion of a Jewish state. So our existence is a threat for Israel, not just in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Our existence inside Israel is a threat for Israel because the meaning of a Jewish state is to have Jewish as a majority, that the state should, con should be controlled by Jewish people, and that there is no other people who have should can have a self determination from within this land from the river to the sea and it was israel was very honest 2018 when she passed a law israel as a nation state yeah this is the name israel as a nation state yes and this law, which, which was passed 2018 not 1948 not in the 60s and the 50s 70 years after the establishment of Israel, Israel is redefining itself as a colonial identity. It is, and, and this is what we are, we are a threat because Israel couldn't normalize itself as a normal state. When you, when you don't succeed to normalize yourself as a normal state, and there is still a people which fight for their freedom and for justice and for democracy, and you still want to implement your colonial project, 60 years after colonialism went out of the world, this is a problem, this is the irony of Israel. Israel cannot be colonially, she chooses a bad time to be a colonial entity. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, maybe Israel, 100, 120 years ago, can do it. But now, with this international awareness, with the media, with the raising awareness about justice, when the Palestinian issue is not the issue of the Palestinians anymore. It is not my issue. It is your issue. It is the issue of anyone who believes in justice. Who any, for anyone who cannot be neutral against genocide and against killing people. So the irony of Israel that the Palestinians who are so weak, Israel has finished Gaza, finished Gaza. There is no Gaza, there is, there is nothing. But she needs to be normalized. She needs legitimacy from the, the, the from the world and she needs to be normal and this is the power of the palestinians this is the only power of the palestinians we will say no and as long as we will say no you will not be a normal a normal state and this is regardless the outcome of of genocide because Gans, what what Gans said Gans said we will let the, the, our 
reaction vibrate, vibrate for generations. Yes, this, the, the result will, will vibrate, but not in, the, not in the way you want it to vibrate. Israel is now tried, Israel tried, this was, this is my analysis, Israel tried to normalize itself. Till the, 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 the second intifada, the 7th of October, sent a very clear message that Israel cannot guarantee its existence within this golden equation, democratic and Jewish. Israel must reveal it, its truth and 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 behave as wahsh monster as a monster as long as it wants to guarantee its existence israel now is a monster and the outcome of this monster will will begin i think will begin to appear the outcome on the israeli society will begin to appear after the end of military operation. So let me ask you this. This is a, we have about five more minutes. And by the way, if you're joining me now, this is the Miko Pellet Hour. I'm Miko Pellet and we're speaking to Hanin Zabi, uh, a, a Palestinian leader uh, in Nazareth, who lives in Nazareth in Northern Palestine. So uh, I want to ask you about Gaza. And I know we don't have a lot of time. We have about five minutes. But the I want to ask you two things about about what is happening in Gaza, about this uh, hor horrible genocide that's taking place. One is, you know, people are t calling for a ceasefire, and I've never heard that ceasefire is a response to a genocide. It's the first time. I mean, I can't imagine people calling for a ceasefire in the midst of any other genocide, but that's the one thing. It seems like very small. It also creates the impression of symmetry, which does, this doesn't exist, of course. And the other part of the question is that people ask very often, so what's next? Let's say they stop the killing at some point. Like you said, Gaza is completely destroyed. Millions of people are homeless. What is your projection of what happens next? So if you can touch on both of those things. It's a very hard question because I don't have a glue. I, I don't know how Gaza will enter into life, will will continue a normal life after the end of military operation. But what I that really Nico, I don't know, but I think that nothing will be the same again. Not just in Gaza. In Gaza it's obvious. And uh, the struggle for rebuilding Gaza, I'm afraid before, before rebuilding Gaza and before the end of the war, I'm afraid what will happen with these 1.2 million or 1.7 million sometimes, they say, who have display, um, who are displaced. I, 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 I don't know how how they can return, I don't know to where they can, can return, I don't know how many of them will want to go out of Gaza, because it's normal. People now, even without ethnic cleansing, people now, I think, want to go out of Gaza. It is very sad to say so, but very human. Well, they can go out back to Palestine. I mean, that would be really the good, so the right solution would be to allow them to go back to Palestine and to rehabilitate and spend the billions of dollars to build. But none, none of this, let me kind of push on this where I was good trying to go with this. And again, the context of ceasefire. <clears throat> you know, nothing, nothing is actually going to happen. Nothing positive will happen unless the world demands sanctions, severe sanctions, an embargo on weapons against Israel, you know, unless there's some kind of a blockade against Israel that really challenges and paralyzes Israel. The Palestinian fighters after, you know, that came in on October 7, paralyzed the state of Israel for a very long time and really changed the game. Uh, but of course, Palestinians are paying a heavy price. The next step has to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, 
the international community has to demand sanctions, severe sanctions. There has to be severe boycotts. There has to be an embargo on weapons sales to Israel. These are the kinds of things that, again, this is my opinion. I want to hear what you have to, what you think. The kinds of things that can actually bring change. Nothing less than that. You know, asking Israel to agree to a ceasefire is is too small. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I hope I don't know that something will happen within the West Bank. I don't. I don't. Something should happen <clears throat> within the West Bank and within the Palestinian Authority, collapsing of Palestinian Authority and intifada against Israel, which can push the sa sanctions and which can which can push the international level to go steps further. Because after this genocide, we didn't succeed in pushing the international uh, international community to be more active on sanction and to put more action and i agree with you 100 percent the position of the u.s of the usa and biden was and the support the, 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 the level of support was a catastrophe we know that the u.s backed israel every in, in every way but we didn't imagine i think I, I think even you didn't imagine i don't know such a support with the weapons with the legitimacy without any fear i think that the minute the the usa and britain change our our, our reluctant our stopping the uh, uh, unrestricted support to israel the minute and when they will do that or consider that the minute the minute something happened within the palestinians in the west bank the way i i think that the next development should be not on the international level not because i don't believe in that in the efficiency but i don't see it happen because what more should be so it should be going on on Gaza in order for the international community to act. But the West Bank is boiling, boiling, boiling. Yeah. It's boiling. The army, the number of the Israeli army in the West Bank now is more than the number of the army in Gaza. Do you know that? The number they have moved <clears throat> from Gaza to the West Bank. And I don't know. They are afraid. They are. We are talking about scenarios in during Ramadan, but something should happen within the Palestinian uh, people in order to push the international community. I don't see the first move coming from the international community. Always, we the Palestinian should have the first move. Yeah. Well, we have to finish now. Our time is up. Um... Uh, you know, I, I, perhaps, I mean, I don't think anybody has the answer to this. The international community has been silent and uh, we're trying to do a lot of things here in Washington, D.C., but Palestinians are also, of course, doing everything they can, you know, granted they're living in a prison. But anyway, I want to thank you, Hanin, very much for your time. It's been, uh, it's been a fascinating conversation. I've been talking to Hanin Zabi now for the past hour. Uh, from Palestine. This is Miko Pellet. Please stay tuned. Um, Soul Conversations is coming up right after this. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next week. Thank you, Miko. Bye. Bye.